It's a funny thing when you talk about fear uh, because we all get scared about something. And I always find it striking that when I think of when do I become most scared, and I think you'll resonate to this, when you feel most scared is at night. In fact, when you think about fear, it, it's in the night when you can't see what's ahead of you or behind you or around you. We can believe when we are in the night, we can believe that we see things in the dark that aren't there and they just elevate our fears. It's at night that we feel so very little control and we often get caught hiding in the corners when we hear funny noises in our houses at night and we lock the doors wondering if someone or something is out there and we don't even know what there means but they're there to get us there. I remember as a child growing up and I always believed that there was a monster under the bed. And I think when I was a little child, my parents spent an awful lot of time on their knees, bending down, looking under the bed, and assuring me that there's nothing under the bed. But you see, in the dark, there are things that live under the bed. The trials of Jesus are all covered with darkness. When you read verse to verse to verse to verse, one sees the fear and the desperation and the hopelessness all happening in trial on this most holy night, and it's all happening in the dark. And we begin to wonder if fear will win. We know in the dark that Judas led the chief priests and the elders and the temple guards and the crowds of servants to arrest Jesus. We know on this very dark night that Judas did the holy kiss in the darkness. And we know that Peter came through the dark in the shadows and he cut off the ear of the servant Malchus. We know that Jesus was arrested and in the dark he was paraded to Annas' house. Annas was the former high priest and was a man of substantial influence in the time of Jesus. And then after that, they went to the home of Caiaphas, the current high priest, and there in this place, Jesus was placed on his first trial. Oh, my friends, the fear in the dark is so overwhelming. I, I think of the apostles that were in the garden. Jesus is arrested. And we know that at that point with all the servants and, and with the guards there and the chief priests and the elders, all these people are there that everybody was running around. You can hear the chaos of the night. Jesus is arrested. And at that moment that they grabbed Jesus, I think all those other servants looked to grab the other apostles and they all fled. We know from the Gospel of Mark that there was a young man who was in the garden and it, it's probably Mark. And it says that he let his pajamas go and he ran home naked because he was fearing his arrest. But what about the other disciples? I think with Peter and John, I think they ran out the gate of the Garden of Gethsemane. And when they ran out the gate, they ran up the hill of the Mount of Olives. Remember, at that time, the Mount of Olives was an olive tree orchard. And in the dark, they ran up the hill and they hid in the olive trees. And they could watch from afar the arrest of Jesus, and they could see the crowds pulling Jesus along and taking him out of the Garden of Gethsemane and pulling him in to the city of Jerusalem, walking down the Kidron Valley, up the Kidron Valley, into the beautiful gate and through the narrow streets of Jerusalem, heading towards Annas' house and finally ending up at Caiaphas' home for the arrest. They watched all of this and something inside of Peter and John said to follow to follow in the dark, maybe standing off a bit as they followed the crowds on the journey through the streets of Jerusalem. And they followed and walked at a distance, each of them trailing along. You see, they knew that Jesus loved them and they certainly loved Jesus. And what do we know about the darkness as they hid in those trees and they began to walk in the shadows? We know that the darkness, the darkness always produces fear and anxiety and certainly at times desperation. It makes us question who we are. 
And the scriptures tell us that these two men quietly walked along through the streets and they finally ended up at Caiaphas's house. And their love for Jesus drove them into the shadows and they followed the mob. John must have known the high priest. There had to be some connection in the family of John because when John entered into the gate, they knew him and he was allowed to go into the trial of Jesus. Peter was not known to them and Peter was allowed inside the gate in the courtyard and he was waiting for John's return. And I can tell you, in the evenings in Jerusalem, it does get cold. It's on mountains, and at this time of the year, it did get pretty cold. And so there they all kind of huddled, and they started a fire in that courtyard. And that's where Peter steps into the picture. And there he hides around the fire, trying to stay warm. I could see him covering himself with his outer coat and maybe trying to cover his head so that people wouldn't see him. He wants to be warm, out of the shadows, maybe a bit into the light of the night where the servants could see him. You see, the servants that are there, they had seen the arrest. They knew the arrest. They were familiar with the arrest. And they knew Peter. They had witnessed everything that had happened to Jesus. And a young girl, speaking out of the shadows, she becomes the voice of fear. She becomes the voice of fear. She looked at closely at Peter, it says in Luke, and it says, this man was with him. And the text says, but Peter denied it. Woman, I don't know him. I don't know him. We could point to Peter and we could question his loyalty to Jesus or his weak nature that he couldn't stand firm and, and, and we could push him to, and shove him. Come on, Peter, stand up, be strong. We could do a message on being persistent, being loyal. He did collapse in his fear. And it's so easy to point the finger and say what he should have done. But I do have a question for you. I do have a question for you tonight. I wonder what your voice of fear is in your life. What's your voice of fear? The young woman in Peter's life, she becomes the voice of fear, not intentionally. She's just asking a question. We don't even know if it was a, a defensive question. She was pointing out, you were with Jesus, and now you're here. But that voice of fear pricked right into Peter's heart and it pricked right into his soul where he felt so scared and so alone. But what is your fear, uh, that voice of fear in your life? What is it? In the dark of the night, what voice speaks into your head that keeps you awake? What voice of fear in your head at night makes you ask questions about your life? What, what voice in the nights pushes you on your self-worth? and what you're supposed to be doing with your life, and are you really good enough? What voice of fear in the night gives you the sense of despair and you wonder if you can get to the morning, to the light? And sometimes those voices of the night, they become a scream in our heads, and sometimes they simply are a whisper that never goes away. Moses had the voice of fear when he was confronted by a burning bush. Just read it in Exodus. He gave all sorts of reasons why he couldn't rescue Israel. Elijah had a voice of fear when he sat in a cave, fearing for his life and wondering in his own self-pity if there was anyone else that believed in God. David had the voice of fear when he fled from King Saul and he wondered if he would live. Just read the Psalms. You'll find Psalms by David over and over again that speak to betrayal, and fear and a loss of hope. And now we have Peter sitting by a, a, a fire, living in the voice of fear, and it came from a young woman. For Peter that night, it happened three times. People saw him at the arrest, and now they look him in the eyes and ask him again and again, weren't you with Jesus? Weren't you with Jesus? And each time the voice of fear hammers him, he responds in a stronger and stronger manner. His voice of fear was so strong. And sometimes we believe that the voice of fear is going to win. We think it's going to win. 
and you wonder if there's any way to be victorious over the fears because life circumstances seem to beat us down. But I'm here today to speak what the scriptures say over and over again. Fear not. Fear not. Fear not. As the rooster crows the third time that night, it says an interesting picture. The rooster crows, and at that moment, Jesus is walking through the courtyard to his next trial. Luke tells us that Jesus turned his head, and he looks straight into Peter's eyes, and Peter remembers what Jesus predicted. Before the rooster crows three times, you will deny me. And then Peter sees the eyes of Jesus. I'm going to tell you, when he looked into Jesus' eyes, I don't think he saw condemnation. I don't think he saw judgment. I think what he saw was the man who loved him. And he looked at Peter, now arrested, his death coming quite soon. And he looked at Peter with love. And Peter saw the love. And he loved Jesus. And he was broken in his own guilt, in his own shame. Much that we carry ourselves. Our own voice of fear creates the guilt and the shame. And Peter breaks down and he cries. He cries. What I do know is this. We know what happened with Peter. We know that Jesus came to Peter later after the resurrection, John chapter 21, and he brings uh, wholeness back to Peter. He forgives Peter for the denial. He embraces Peter, and Peter is empowered for the rest of his life. But I wonder, what happened to the servants? What happened to that young woman that listened to Jesus uh, at, at the arrest and now in the courtyard confronting Peter? What happened to that woman? What happened to the other two people who confronted Peter there in the garden, each being at the garden and each seeing the arrest? But maybe for the young woman, maybe she witnessed the trial of Jesus. And maybe she witnessed the death of Jesus. Maybe she just walked by where the crucifixion took place. And maybe this young woman heard about the resurrection three days later. And she remembered everything about the arrest. And a man who sat by a fire who was there because he loved Jesus. And she knew with the resurrection that this Jesus was someone special. The Son of God. The Redeemer our rescuer. In Christ's name, amen.